we're going to talk about cancer related fatigue and hopefully at the end of the presentation, you'll have a little better understanding, or at least we can help answer some questions and get you on the right track to maybe help um, provide some interventions to help with the fatigue. So, let's get started and there will definitely be question and answer session um, at the end. So let's talk a little bit about some learning objectives for today. Oh, let me just go right ahead. Okay, some learning objectives for today. Um, we would like to learn the difference between cancer-related fatigue and regular fatigue. Um, also, excuse me one second, um, understand the importance reporting fatigue um, and being able to address the treatable contributing factors, identify risks for developing cancer-related fatigue, recognize the effects of cancer-related fatigue that can interfere with everyday aspects of your life, decreasing quality of life, and we're going to review some of the recommended approaches and management to helping with the fatigue. So let's talk a little bit about what it is. What is the definition um, specifically of cancer-related fatigue? The National Comprehensive Cancer Network, or NCCN, defines cancer-related fatigue, and I may say CRF throughout the presentation, meaning same thing, um, is a persistent and subjective sense of physical, emotional, and or cognitive tiredness or exhaustion that is related to cancer or cancer treatment and it is not proportional to recent activity and it interferes with usual functioning. So the important part of the definition is that it is not proportional to any recent activity and that it interferes with your everyday activities. When we talk a little more about cancer-related fatigue and the definition, um, it is the most common and it's often reported as the most distressing symptom that patients identify um, when they're going through the diagnosis of cancer. It can be even more distressing than pain or nausea or vomiting or other GI side effects that, that patients often um, go through while going through treatment. So about um, 45, up to 45% of patients report some type of fatigue while they're undergoing chemotherapy and or radiation therapy. Those numbers can even go as high as 96%. And also for cancer survivors and patients who have completed therapy, it's estimated that between 19 and up to 82% of patients experience this fatigue as mild to moderate, and it can last um, up to a year or more. So the real difference between acute fatigue is that it lasts one month or less, and chronic fatigue can last from one month to um, years. And this is the kind of fatigue that we're going to be focusing on today. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the facts around cancer-related fatigue. And how do we know that that's what we're, we're experiencing? So cancer-related fatigue can be all-consuming. It can be a result of physical, psychosocial, spiritual, and mental exhaustion. It may interfere with um, normal everyday activities, unable to perform activities of daily living. It can affect your concentration, your ability to solve problems and make decisions. It can be influenced by demographic, medical, behavioral, or biological factors, all of these having a negative impact on quality of life. So what do we mean by that? So basically age, gender, other chronic illnesses, um, other coping mechanisms, <clears throat> genetic influences, hormones, nutrition, all of these things can, um, can be affected by cancer-related fatigue and have an influence on that. So some of the symptoms, as we discuss it more, um, as we talked about, can affect your ability to concentrate, to um, organize or complete tasks, to stay focused. It can interfere with work um, or school schedules, um, basically everyday life. It can 
increase um, distress. It can lead to um, changes in your mood, irritability, causing increased worry, anxiety, depression, and sometimes inability to cope with everyday stressors. It can also limit the ability to do activities of daily living like we're talking about, sometimes even simply taking a shower. Um, it, you can feel too tired to participate in family life, um, social interactions, community activities, um, the roles and activities that make your life meaningful. Basically decrease your overall physical functioning, which contributes to um, further deconditioning and worsening fatigue. So this fatigue, oh, let me back up one here. This fatigue actually affects overall sense of self. Um, it can lead to further self-doubt, lack of confidence, negative thinking, as we discussed, changes in mood and increased anxiety. So some of the qualities of cancer-related fatigue that differ from other kinds of fatigue um, that we can say it often begins suddenly during treatment or even after treatment. It can appear or persist for months, and I've had a few patients say even years after their treatment has ended. And more descriptive, it's this constant feeling of tiredness, exhaustion, um, that's unrelated again to activity or overactivity. You can sleep for eight hours or more and wake up and still feel tired. So unrelieved by rest or sleep. It's usually characterized by causing a feeling of heaviness, especially in the legs, unusual or excessive whole body tiredness, general weakness. It's more intense and more severe, more energy draining and longer lasting than other types of fatigue. So, despite how common we know that cancer-related fatigue is, again, being one of the number one symptoms that patients experience during treatment, it's often underreported by patients. So, if it's underreported, then it's underdiagnosed and, as a result, undertreated. So, why? Why is it so underreported? So, fatigue is subjective and it's hard to measure objectively. And the meaning of that is that the severity and qualities are what you, the patient, say it is. So if you're saying you're trying to express how tired you are, it's a personal experience and it's often different from patient to patient. Only you can explain that to your healthcare provider of exactly how tired you really feel and how it's limiting your quality. Sometimes patients don't wish to um, report fatigue because they think it's an expected side effect. Um, and, and as it is, we know that it is an expected side effect, but sometimes I think patients don't realize how over encompassing their life it is and how it is interfering. So maybe they don't report it. They don't want to bother the healthcare providers. They don't want to be seen possibly as a complainer. Um, they may only report fatigue when it becomes so overwhelming that it severely interferes with their functioning, maybe their <clears throat> job, their, their roles as either um, a parent, a spouse, all of, all of our everyday life roles. Um, when it becomes really encompassing, then they report it. Some people believe that there's no treatment for it and that they just have to live with it. Or others might fear that the fatigue means that their cancer is coming back or their cancer is getting worse or they're, they're not responding to their treatment. Oftentimes people may think if they report a high level of fatigue that their treatment might be changed or, um, or the dose might be reduced. So these are all just some, some reasons why people have stated that they, they didn't want to report it. And then oftentimes it's the provider um, or the physician that's the barrier to the care. So if the doctors and re the nurses do rely on the reporting and description of the <coughs> by the patient, but oftentimes um, the physicians or providers may not initiate that discussion about uh, fatigue. Maybe they're waiting for the patient um, to report it to them 
or they may believe that cancer related fatigue is not any different than usual tiredness. They may not think that treating it is as important as treating some of the other symptoms or managing other symptoms like pain or some of the um, GI side effects. Um, they may not recognize it as a specific um, severe problem for the patient. They may not be aware that there are effective treatments for fatigue. Excuse me one second. Um, okay, let's go on. So there is no one specific task to diagnose fatigue. The level or extent of fatigue is determined by your description, the patient's description of it. The screening for fatigue should really be done at every office visit. Patients should be asked how their energy level is, um, have their activities of daily living been affected? And it's just a simple rating system, a numerical system, um, where zero would be no fatigue and 10 would be the worst. So if if we ask a patient, how is your fatigue level? How tired are you on a scale of zero to 10? And someone says, oh, it's a two or a three. We would consider that mild um, and we would continue to evaluate them. If they say that their level is anywhere between a four and a six, then obviously that's there in the middle. It'd be moderate. We would, um, we would have a discussion. We would talk about some interventions. Uh, we would definitely continue to follow up. And if someone told me that their fatigue level was anywhere from seven to 10, then I would be very concerned. I would definitely want to start talking about um, um, interventions and or, you know, look at the treatment plan and possibly see um, where there would be some, some help or for sure start looking at some other contributing factors that might be causing this severe level of fatigue. And this is just the little fatigue scale where we see um, exactly what we discussed, the, the level, the rating of zero to 10. You can see zero is no fatigue, um, one, two, and three mild, four to six would be moderate, and then extreme and the worst fatigue where someone really can't um, get, out of the, get out of their chair or do any of their usual activities. So some of the risk factors um, again, would be cancer related fatigue happens in patients who are otherwise healthy, so they may not have many contributing factors, but we do know that uh, the treatments, the type of treatment, the dose intensity, meaning how often they get their treatment. If there's combination therapy, meaning they may have gotten chemo and radiation or possibly and biological therapy or hormonal therapy, all of these things can consistently add to the fatigue, especially in the post treatment. So even when they're finished, we take a look at all of the, the treatments and the types and and lots of other things like blood counts. Um, we would want to know in the history if patients experienced any fatigue prior to starting therapy, because that's often a strong predictor of how they're going to feel afterwards. So if they are already coming in and their baseline fatigue is, is pretty high, then we know that it's something that we definitely have to discuss and make a plan for throughout the treatment. Oftentimes, this fatigue is associated with inflammation. It can be associated with immune and neuroendocrine um, processes, can be um, your white blood cells or red blood cells, um, gluco glucocorticoid production, um, meaning any kind of other um, levels or cortisol levels. So all of these things um, have to be taken into consideration and basically what the baseline um, chronic illnesses that the patients may have as well. Any personal history of depression, anxiety, or psychological distress, um, we would discuss that. Any sleep disturbances. We did talk about insomnia last year um, during one of our presentations. So if someone's having issues with sleep, then that definitely um, can contribute to fatigue. If someone has a high body mass index, um, of overweight, poor nutrition, these can also be predictors of early or persistent fatigue. And sometimes we've noted, known that lower household incomes, um, possibly unmarried patients may be a little um, at higher risk for developing fatigue. 
So the exact causes are unknown, um, but it's usually a combination of factors that can cause this, and they can range from actually the cancer itself, which does change your body um, and cause some increase in fatigue. Um, the cancer treatments definitely can cause fatigue. Uh, again, we talked about combination therapy, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, hormonal therapy, and all of the things that go with the late and long-term effects of therapy. Other contributing factors, anemia. So anemia is a decrease in the red blood cells and hemoglobin, which carry the oxygen. So if your oxygen level is low, then you're definitely going to be more tired. Um, any other pre-existing conditions like um, hypothyroidism, diabetes, any other metabolic disorders, um, heart disease, GI problems, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or breathing issues, um, osteoarthritis, um, kidney function. Um, some women go through menopause when they're on treatment, which can definitely um, cause other issues like insomnia, hot flashes, lymphedema, or pain. Um, pain medications themselves can cause patients to be tired and feel fatigued. And if someone develops any viruses or infection um, while on treatment or off treatment, that can also lead to um, increased fatigue. Some other things like emotional distress, depression, anxiety, chronic stress, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, it, even just having a fear that the cancer may come back, maybe causing an increased stress level, contributing to fatigue. Physical deconditioning, if we're starting already at a deconditioned level, um, or if, if patients have become so deconditioned during therapy that they're unable to do physical activity, that's definitely a contributing factor. Nutritional deficiencies, either too much or too little food, or little nutritional value or eating disorders. Um, other medications, over-the-counter medications can cause fatigue, sleep disorders, insomnia or sleep apnea, a lack of social support, um, feeling isolated and lonely. And sometimes that's just a, a, a round robin circle there where patients are too tired to go out and, and participate in some of the social activities. And then a previous history or a history of alcohol or substance abuse, all of these things can be contributing factors. So when we talk about how can we treat or what are some of the interventions we can do for treating these patients, um, or treating the symptoms, anemia is definitely one we can treat by transfusion or possibly other medications that can help with anemia. Pain and pain medications, we can certainly take a look at that and see how the patients are taking their medications. Is it causing increase in fatigue? Is it causing the patient to be sleepy? Um, emotional distress, anxiety, depression, chronic, chronic stress. Um, sleep disturbances, insomnia, apnea, we can certainly treat those, um, poor nutrition, uh, low activity level. We'll talk a, a lot about exercise, comorbidities like hypothyroidism, heart disease, um, COPD, diabetes, and again, very treatable if a patient has an illness or infection, um, viral or bacteria, we know bacterial that we can treat those and help, um, with the fatigue that is associated with those. So how do we manage it? So managing it, managing fatigue is very complicated as are all the factors that contribute to it. So we first have to find some of the contributing factors like we just discussed. Um, if the fatigue is interfering with all aspects of life, including emotional um, and physical well-being, family and interpersonal relationships, work and school. So that's a bigger issue that we do have to address. Um, managing the fatigue is an integral part of the total health care, and all the patients should receive symptom management. So we have to identify it. We have to know it's a problem. We have to look at some of the other contributing factors, and then we can hopefully help manage that. So if the 
Fatigue is not resolved by fixing one or more of the treatable or contributing factors, like if a patient's anemic and we are able to transfuse them, if we're able to possibly start some um, behavioral wellness sessions and that doesn't help either, then we definitely have to put a, a treatment plan in place and start looking at, at the current treatment the patient's on. So there's several interventions that are recommended, but there's no specific gold standard for treatment. So again, it's going to be, um, it's caused by many things. So we're going to have to try to help fix it by having um, many options to do that. So let's talk a little bit about exercise. So managing cancer-related fatigue with exercise is the one treatment that has consistently been shown to improve the fatigue, the level of functioning, and to help improve quality of life. So I know a lot of people hear that and they're telling us how tired they are. I'm so tired. I can't get out of bed or I can't get out of the chair. And then we're going to say, oh, well, you need to go exercise, right? So that doesn't sound like a great intervention, but it really does. It really does help. And we want to start with something that's really slow. We don't want anyone to go run a marathon or go to the gym and lift heavy weights. When we talk about exercise, we're really talking about something that we're going to start really slow. And some of the benefits of exercise increase the sense of well-being, be, and it helps promote a self of, of someone being in control of their life and of the fatigue. It can um, help with depression. It can decrease stress, improve mood. It actually helps with appetite and sleep. Uh, it helps with concentration and just an overall sense of well-being. It can actually help increase the ability to participate in some of those activities of daily living that patients may be too tired. So a lot of people have joint pain. Um, that's something obviously that goes with age and osteoarthritis and things like that. Um, some of the treatments can affect the joints, but exercise can also help strengthen the joints and the bones and help with the pain and the stiffness. It can help lower blood pressure. It can help with improving your heart's ability to pump and all of these things. So initially, uh, an evaluation by a physical therapist would be ideal. Um, we would recommend to have a, someone help design a safe plan. And it's really important um, that you have, if you have an underlying Condition, um, condition like cancer or significantly deconditioned that we do have someone that's there to help um, plan your activity. We would choose an activity that you're comfortable with and something that you enjoy. We would start really slow and then gradually increase that length of time. So we would wanna start with 15 to 20 minutes a day and then gradually build that up to three to five hours a week. And um, if you do, if you start working out and you start slow and you still experience like a lot of soreness, stiffness, you feel out of breath, you may be overdoing it. So walking is really the best form of exercise. It's safe, it's convenient, it's cheap, um, it stimulates energy, it helps maintain balance and mobility. And there's a few other things that are kind of easy on the joints like swimming, some of the health clubs have um, a swimming pool and they actually have like um, uh, programs or like exercise classes that are in the pool, which is really helpful as well. It's very easy on your joints. Maybe even um, some cycling or rowing some of the machines if you have um, someone there to kind of help with that. So, Exercise is definitely suggested um, by some of our national organizations, the Oncology Nursing Society, and again, we talked a little bit about the NCCN. They both recommend exercise as an intervention to help reduce cancer-related fatigue, um, and that is for patients who are undergoing active treatment, patients who have recently finished treatment, or any stage of the cancer continuum. Um, the current NCCM practice guidelines recommend that exercise programs for cancer patients, again, begin slow, low intensity, increase them slowly, and, and be sort of individualized to each patient. Um, another organization called the American College of Sports Medicine um, recommends exercise guidelines for all cancer patients, not only to help reduce the 
cancer-related fatigue, but also it'll help improve quality of life and body image. So, uh, in speaking about the American College of Sports Medicine, um, they actually promoted a campaign in 2007 along with the American Medical Association. And this campaign was called um, Exercise is Medicine. The goal was to include exercise as part of the plan for all patients and all medical professionals to include exercise as an actual prescription for healthy living. So when patients go to the physician, either for a checkup or for a sick visit or whatever they go for, exercise should always be sort of included in a plan to help reduce some of these other comorbidities and just to help with overall well-being. And it was sort of launched as exercise as medicine and a physician would actually write a prescription um, with recommendations of how the patients, um, how they would like their patients to start exercising. So again, sort of adding to that knowledge that exercise is very helpful for everyone. And I wanna talk a little bit about a research study that I did, and this was in 2016. Uh, it was published. It was uh, a look at patients who recently finished their treatment. So within a 90 day time frame of finishing treatment. Um, the name of the study was evaluating the effects of a physician referred program on cancer related fatigue and quality of life among early cancer survivors. So, the purpose of the study was to evaluate the effectiveness of a supervised 60 day. Physician referred exercise program on self reported. Cancer related fatigue and quality of life in these patients. So, I enrolled 70 patients in the study. Um, who completed their cancer treatment within the past 90 days. They were doing pre and post test evaluations and they needed to attend the exercise program at least two days a week um, for 60 days. So out of the patients that were enrolled, 38 um, patients completed that. So about 54%, um, but the scores were really significant. So the cancer related fatigue scores significantly decreased and the quality of life score significantly increased. So basically what that means is that the findings of the study were very statistically significant and they had um, clinical meaning for the patients because they felt better. So the results suggested definitely that exercise helped reduce this cancer related fatigue as we've been discussing and improve the overall quality of life for these cancer survivors. Um, these findings definitely added to the published body of knowledge that, that um, regard exercise as effective intervention for these patients. Um, and it also really told us that the patients completing cancer treatment should be assessed for fatigue and encouraged to enroll in a supervised exercise or any kind of cancer rehabilitation program. Actually, it may also lead to early recognition and improved outcomes for our patients. So just a little bit more information and kind of a little bit more of a plug for exercise and how we know that it can help. So really overall in managing cancer related fatigue, we want our patients to be educated. We want them to understand that they're often unprepared for this. Like we talk a little bit about it or like, you know, patients sometimes are feeling fatigued, they lose their energy, but sometimes even though we discuss it, I think patients are unprepared because they don't realize the impact or maybe the severity that it'll have on their life. So I think learning about it, recognizing it up front is very helpful. Um, also to understand some of the cognitive and behavioral um, strategies that have been shown to help decrease fatigue as well. We know that knowledge um, empowers us and empowers our sense of control over many things in our life and also over fatigue. Um, if we know about these things, it can help decrease um, the worry about them and the misconceptions. Um, it can help us sort of expect the pattern. Um, we would ask patients to keep an activity log, like list all of their activities, maybe even how these are changing as they're going through their treatment or after their treatment. 
like how long does it take you to do something? How long did it used to take you to do it? Um, how do you feel when you do them? How long does it take you to recover after doing maybe a simple everyday task? And what helps and what doesn't help? So these are all really important things that you can discuss with um, your healthcare provider and sort of give us a little better clue um, as to what we can do and what some of the interventions we can um, we can add. Also, like who to call. So if you're recognizing these patterns and you're at home and you're like these things are getting worse instead of better, like who do you reach out to? You know, who in your healthcare team? You call your primary care physician. Possibly, if you feel like there's an underlying depression there, your psychologist or social worker, um, and even sometimes a chaplain um, or or a spiritual advisor that you're close with. So when we talk about sometimes the stressors, let's talk a little bit about cognitive behavioral therapy. What is it? So basically cognitive behavioral therapy teaches us that thoughts can influence feelings and behavior and they can change the way we think and how we respond to certain situations. So CBT um, can help decrease sometimes emotional burdens of cancer and cancer symptoms by helping um, address some of these problems. So poor or insufficient coping or stress can sometimes lead to these issues, fear that the cancer may recur or come back, feeling depressed, hopeless or uncertain, having inadequate social support um, or possibly negative social interactions or any changing patterns of sleep and activity. All of these things can help be addressed um, with cognitive behavioral therapy. When we talk about some of the things like mind and body therapy, we know that exercise therapies, as we talked about, are helpful, but we can even take that a step further and incorporate some mental and spiritual elements with movement, stretching, and balance. Like an example, yoga. So yoga is recommended for cancer survivors by the um, National Cancer Coalition Network and by the Society of Integrative Oncology. They recommend at least two sessions per week, um, and it was strongly associated with less fatigue and better sleep qualities. Also, um, Kwai Gong and Tai Chi um, have both been as associated with some um, mind-body therapy, although um, I don't think a lot of patients possibly know what, what that is, or maybe patients don't participate. It's really um, incorporating body, posture, movement, breathing, meditation, and these things are done through martial arts. There's other therapies that um, are likely to be effective, again, incorporating relaxation exercises with meditation that can help um, reduce stress. There's some things that um, may, we don't know how effective they are, like there's certain medications people may take to help with fatigue. Um, acupuncture, acupressure, nutritional supplements, Reiki, aromatherapy, reflexology, and massage. So these may very well be helpful for some patients. Um, we just don't have a lot of data or a lot of research that tell us how effective they may be. Nutrition. So again, nutrition is so important. Uh, nutrition can help prevent or decrease Fatigue um, by eating the right foods and a healthy, well-balanced diet with lots of fruits and vegetables and whole grains. They can help um, increase energy and help the body work efficiently. And fluids, we have to remember. So if many of you have been through therapy, we're always stressing drink, drink increased water. And then I think sometimes after therapy, people may not still be drinking as much butter as they should. So dehydration can definitely add to fatigue. It can cause low blood pressure and things that can even make you feel more tired. So we want to make sure that we're drinking at least those eight cups of um, water per day. Actually, you know, other fluids are fine as well, but we want to make sure they don't have a lot of sugar in them and caffeine um, can sort of uh, be counterproductive if we drink too much caffeine during the day. Um, if you're not eating very well, or you don't have a big appetite, you can try small frequent meals and maybe consider taking a multivitamin, but knowing that vitamins are not like a substitute for trying to eat well. Uh, also, there's been some clinical trials where ginseng was found to help with cancer related fatigue. 
Um, and I looked that up and there are some studies out there. Um, it takes about four weeks to work. The recommendation is about a thousand milligrams of the ginseng in a pill form or capsule form twice a day. Um, but also I would definitely want you to discuss that with your, your healthcare providers because ginseng can interfere or interact rather with some other medications like blood thinners. So I would say definitely discuss it with your healthcare provider. And then again, um, speak with a dietitian if you have specific um, concerns about your diet or um, or what you could eat that might help. We can talk a little bit about energy conservation. So possibly organizing and planning ahead if you know you have uh, a big outing or something coming up and you want to try to conserve your energy, um, then you know that would be great. You want to combine some activities, try to simplify things, set priorities, and, you know, kind of rate your tasks or what you need to do in order of importance and deciding that not everything has to be done every single day so that you can sort of um, rest and, and have those rest periods and, and better plan for what you need to do. And also, I think that people don't like to delegate. They know that they have a list of things that they like to do. And even though people ask, what can I help you with? Some, some of us just don't like to do that. We like to be in control and we like to do all of our own things. But don't be afraid to ask for help if you're feeling really overwhelmed or really tired and you just need a little bit more time to recover. And also consider occupational therapy evaluation because they may be able to help most of the time, occupational therapy um, is with physical therapy, and you can ask to sort of um, speak with someone that can help you learn, like these energy saving strategies, um, importance of um, doing tasks, and maybe um, how to simplify doing some of your tasks. We did a talk about sleep a little bit. So as you can imagine, sleep can definitely help um, with fatigue. But if we're not getting quality sleep, then that can be one of the contributing factors to cancer relating related fatigue. Up to 88% of cancer patients have some sort of um, sleep disorder that can last well beyond the end of their treatment. So if that's an issue, then that definitely needs to be addressed. Sometimes um, napping during the day or taking too long of a nap can really um, interfere with sleep at night as well. Um, consider replacing the nap with maybe a relaxing activity like meditation um, or yoga. Try to keep the naps to maybe 15, no more than 30 minutes. Uh, try to avoid caffeine, alcohol, or tobacco or smoking before bed. And actually, um, bedtime routines can really help if you try to go to bed at the same time every night, try to wake up around the same time every day. Um, exercise can help with sleep, but we'll try to limit that to no more than three hours before bedtime. And again, create a dark, comfortable environment, avoid watching TV, um, being on your phone or iPad, or working in the bedroom. Um, we can try to treat the insomnia, sleep apnea, or other sleep disorders, because um, sleep apnea is definitely becoming um, more common. So if you notice that um, you're snoring or if someone says, hey, you're, you're snoring and waking up a lot during the night, then that's definitely something that um, you can be tested for quite easily. So make sure that you do um, discuss that with your physician or healthcare provider. And there are some medications that we can talk about that may help, although most of these are more short term. Um, they were originally for, pe for people who work maybe night shift or some other things just to kind of help them because there's some of them are stimulants. So um, Ritalin and Provigil can help um, increase the brain activity and lead to like short-term improvement in energy, but these are definitely not long-term fixes. So um, they're not really FDA approved for fatigue. But, um, again, if this is something that's, a different problem or short term, then it is possible that they may help. Um, some have shown um, improvement in patients with severe fatigue. So again, if it's something that we can use short term until we can fix some of the other contributing factors, then we would definitely consider that. 
They can have side effects like every medication, so they can actually cause more insomnia. They can cause headaches and different cardiovascular things. Um, there are other uh, antidepressants like bupropion that can help. There's a little evidence there that suggests that um, it can help with fatigue. Dexamethasone is a steroid uh, that can also help improve fatigue, but again, there's a list of side effects with um, steroids, so we would want to make sure that that's the right drug for you. Um, and then there are other antidepressants and SSRIs that could be beneficial um, that can help even with other contributing factors like menopause and hot flashes and things like that, that would maybe help re relieve the fatigue or help with depression or other symptoms that could um, overall help with the fatigue. So let's talk a little bit about summary. So we know that cancer-related fatigue is a common problem for our patients either undergoing treatment or patients who have recently completed treatment and unfortunately can last for up to years afterward. Um, the time or how long the fatigue lasts is unique to each person. And fatigue is one of the three most distressing factors associated with um, quality of life in our cancer survivors. The causes are nonspecific and unclear, but likely due to multiple factors. And again, it's important to treat some of these underlying causes of fatigue, like anemia, hypothyroidism, pain, or depression, when we want to treat the fatigue. Exercise is the number one recommended intervention, but other things like mind-body exercise, yoga, um, psychosocial interventions, cognitive behavioral therapy, any of the mindfulness-based stress relaxation therapies can help. We would like you to use self-care strategies, energy conservation, good nutrition, sleep quality. Um, consider participating in one of the health programs here at MD Anderson at Cooper. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then report symptoms of fatigue as soon as possible and plan to discuss fatigue at all of your follow-up appointments if it is affecting your quality of life. A few final words is that cancer experience, as we know, um, from diagnosis to long-term survivorship is unique to each one of you. And it's very important to establish good communication with your healthcare team and your loved ones. Your quality of life is important to us, as is your physical health. So know that, know that it's important to all of your healthcare providers and don't be afraid to discuss that with them. And know that you are not alone. If you don't know who or where your resources are, you can always reach out and ask us um, because we will definitely help you and you deserve ongoing support throughout your survivorship. I wanna thank everybody for participating in today's presentation and a special thank you to Evelyn Robles Rodriguez and Susan Hunter for help with the slides and for Roxanne Berger for all of her support and for being here on the line today. Um, at this time, we will talk about any questions or comments that anyone has about the, the presentation or how you're managing your fatigue and what we can do to help. Any questions, Rox? Um, none in the chat, but I have unmuted everybody so you can unmute yourself if you have a question for Stacy regarding um, CRF. Anybody with any questions? Her presentation was that well that everybody's questions have been answered? No, I have, oh. I have a question. Oh, okay. okay, go ahead. Hello? I, I, what do you do when you're too tired to exercise? So that's why we have to start very slow. Like sometimes just thinking about exercise is really overwhelming, right? So it's important to actually talk with one of the healthcare providers and we'll get a plan together of how we're going to exercise. We're gonna start it like we talked about really slow, if even 15 minutes a day uh, and work our way up. Well, see, I have, well, see, I have, I have COPD also. Correct. My breathing along with my cancer is kind of hard, 15 minutes a day. Sure. So 
there are things we can do. There are like chair exercises, okay. chair yoga, right. those kinds of things. Um, I think it's pound. I can open that up to um, actually, the Good next. Thing. Yeah, the next slide that I wanted Roxanne to talk about a little bit about the fitness and nutrition program. I know it's okay. not right. Through so we have started a new program here for our survivors um, called the FAN program. It's fitness and nutrition and it's led by okay. one of the facilitators through the Diane Barton Complimentary Med, Jen Jennings. She's awesome. I don't know if any of our people are on from that class last night, but it's a 10 week session twice a week and it's geared for cancer survivors. It's not geared for the marathon runner. It's geared for survivors. It is a tool to help you start moving. Um, it's twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. And she starts out with some light stretching and then we have done um, Qigong and we have done stretching. Um, she also deals with the uh, psychosocial aspect of, um, of fitness as far as mental where, clarity, where, 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 uh, getting rid of negativity there? things. So um, if anyone is interested in those um, type, in that particular program, I put my email address in the chat, and I believe it's also listed here um, for you to contact me, and I can send everybody the link, um, who, uh, who, excuse me, who's ever interested in participating in that. Okay, I have a question. Yes. My wife uh, has been diagnosed with uh, SMM or MSS, smalling myeloma, uh, smalling multiple myeloma. Okay. And from what I understand, it's a precancerous condition. But she is so tired every single day. I mean, do you get that with the uh, small during multiple myeloma diagnosis too? You could, you certainly could, because it can affect the blood counts. So I think she would definitely benefit from having a little exercise as well if she would be interested in participating in, in some of the fitness um, and nutrition um, programs here. And I heard someone in the background asking if it's at MD Anderson. It's virtual. Yes, uh, MD Anderson. Hold on. I'm sorry, I had it's another virtual, question. and there's a link that I would send you, and you can either join from your phone or from your computer and participate. Okay, and I did have another question, and this is very important to me because I've always been a large eater. Ate everything and never put on weight. And my weight has come down so low. And I would a nutritionist help be able to help me as far as I'm getting my appetite back. But would a nutritionist be able to help? Okay. Sorry, I might have missed the, the So, were you asking what she said, Stacey, was that she's been. Um, Losing weight, I'm not quite sure, but somebody is, is talking in the back. Needs to mute yes, I'm, I was, I've you. been losing weight, and I didn't have appetite, but my appetite is back. But I was wondering if a nutritionist could help me, because I'm not putting on oh, any uh, weight. Sure, I think we could get her name in, in the chat box, Roxanna. We could have one of our nutritionists reach out to her, correct? Um, if you have, I think she's on the phone talking, but my phone number, um, I'm just going to mute everybody really quickly. That I'll unmute everybody. My phone number is 856-968. 7091 and I can get you in contact with our nutritionist and we can set up something with her. Anybody else with any questions? Um, yes, I, have a I, question. I don't want to go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm actually driving so it's difficult for me to write down any of the information. I'm on my way home from MD Anderson now. Do you mind giving me your name and I can 
or, or you don't have to if you want to. Were you able to get my phone number? No, oh, I didn't get the phone um, number. The last four no. digits. It's eight five six nine six eight. Nine six eight seven zero nine one, and my name is Roxanne Berger. Thank you so Roxanne. much, Roxanne. I have a I'm driving. I can't take that information. My can name I get is your Jerry. name then, and I can reach yes. out to you? Thank you, Jerry J E R R Y Jerry Truano T R U O N O. Okay, Jerry. I will yes, talk my name to you later Pamela. on, um, if not today, then Monday morning. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. My Anybody name is else Pamela, have any questions for Stacy? Yeah, I have yes. a question. Go ahead. I had a question about the anemia. Uh, I've been, this is not working. I have a lower hemoglobin, and I didn't know if there were any medications that would help my anemia for multiple myeloma. Nothing has been said to me that would. Are you on active treatment right now? I will be, yes, active treatment forever, every month. Got you. So I do know um, that there can be other um, medications or maybe even injections, but the hemoglobin has to be below a certain level before we would start that. So it would usually have to be under a 10. And then that is something that you can speak with your physician about. There are injections. Unfortunately, it's uh, it's come up, and I, I'm around twelve. Okay. So. so yeah, so I mean that's a, a little low for for a man. Usually, though, twelve to fifteen is is you know within a a pretty normal level there. So it's a little low, but probably not low enough to treat right now. So okay. I would say that, you know, we would just have to keep monitoring that and it's probably the myeloma itself and maybe the treatment that you're on that's really contributing to um, the fatigue. That's what I'm being told, but yes. I'm trying to find ways to deal with the fatigue and I can get the hemoglobin up. Exactly, but, but right now with the 12, we wouldn't be able to unfortunately give any of the other medications to help with that. Okay. Try the exercise more. A little more activity might help. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. I have problems with neuropathy. I'm five years out from my treatment mm -hmm. uh, from when it first started, and right. it still has not went away. I do get the like the pins and needles in the feet, the legs, sometimes the hands, but right. for the most part, the legs ache. Like, it's like, I don't want to be on my legs for too long. I do a 20 minute walk and more than that, I can't do any more. Are you on treatment for the neuropathy? No, um, I just don't want to take any more medication. Like, I don't want to have to do anything. I did do medication for, uh -huh. neuropathy for quite a few years. It didn't work at all. Are you on any B vitamins? Vitamin I B6? am. B complex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. B yeah, complex B would help somewhat with the neuropathy as well. Um, ginger the, soaks, I, I've heard, help with neuropathy too. What was that? Ginger soaks, like steeping ginger, um, and then using it either like on compresses on your hands and feet or soaking it. Okay. That's a thought. Um, there is there is something new that's out called Nervive or Nervive. I don't know if you've heard of that. No. It's an over-the-counter medication, and it actually combines the B vitamins, um, alpha lipaic acid, and turmeric. And there are three things that we often recommend for neuropathy, but it's all in one. Um, we've had a little success with that, so that's something that you could you know, um, look at and talk to your healthcare provider and make sure it's something you could take. And it is an over-the-counter medication, but I'd still like patients to discuss over-the-counter medications with their providers. But that is all natural, so you can, you know, talk to them and see if it's something that, uh, that they recommend. I am taking a turmeric pill. Okay. And also take the vitamin. Um, 
the fish oil with the turmeric. Mm -hmm. um, and I do ginger, fresh ginger when I can. Ginger. Yes. It's like the upper thigh. Just, they Someone ate. asked me to repeat that. It's called Nervive. N-E-R-V-I-V-E. -E. Could, could you be talking to me about, could you be talking to me about the, uh, the fatigue right now, I can't write down your number, but, but could I give you my number and you call me about the fatigue? Yeah, I think, Rox, are you on to take a number? But Or do you want to just give your number? Yeah, 856. No, hold on, honey, hold on one second. Can can I just, can we just give you Roxanne's number and you can take that sure. or you can't write yeah, let me give you her number. That way we can, you don't have to give yours out in front of everyone. 856-968-7091. My name is Roxanne. Roxanne, yes. Okay, thank you. And then someone else had a question about the ginseng, I believe. The, the ginseng. Recommended dose was a thousand milligrams two to, twice a day. But again, if you're on any blood thinners or other prescription medication, please discuss it with your um, health care provider. Anything else have I can ever, help anyone with? Yeah, have you ever heard of a sour, sour, sour shop? S O U R S O P? Well, I'm sorry. Say that again. S O U U R S O P. Uh -huh. Sour shop. No, I'm sorry. I haven't heard of that. Okay. It says it says that's good for treating cancer with cancer with inflammation. Uh, no, I haven't heard that. Okay. Stacy. Right. Yes. Someone asked about the thousand milligrams. Is that total for the day, or is that two doses? It's twice a day, a thousand milligrams in the AM and a thousand milligrams in the PM. Okay, did that answer your question, Sandra? Okay. Hi, um, I have a question. Um, I was a nurse over at the main hospital for 15 years and gone from working overnight to my cancer diagnosis and put out of work. Um, I can't help but feel um, like bad about how much I sleep like those around me. Are you on active treatment right now? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, like literally now. <laughs> yes, it, it is right. It's a big change. It's a big change for your body. So, you know, if you need to sleep, then sleep. But when you're awake, <laughs> can you do activity? How is your activity? Level? Uh, it's, it's not obviously being on a, on a, hospital floor <laughs> it's not sure. what it was absolutely well i mean i can take care of my adls but i'm just really tired i so, know it is it's exhausting um i think being on active treatment is a little bit different because you know your blood counts and things are really going to be affected right now but i also think that like it's starting to be nice weather and when you feel up to it i think it's great to go out and go do a short walk and i actually talked to a patient about this today sometimes just getting a change and getting out of the house and even just kind of sitting outside for a little while just changes your perspective you know get some fresh air maybe just a little sun i mean i don't mean sunbathe but you know just getting outside and getting a little sun and just getting some of the fresh air changes things and it makes us feel a little bit more you know, alert and what's going on around us. I mean, even working and being inside all day, even if you step outside, you're like, oh, wow, you know, there's a whole world out here. So I think that it's it's a little helpful to do that. Um, and I think if you wanted to participate in the programs here, it's really helpful because, again, it's not it's not over activity, even starting sometimes in a chair and doing stretching and chair yoga is a beginning and a starting point for people that are unable to do that. So any little bit of activity that you can do is really helpful. And I really like to tell patients to try to stick to their normal routines as much as possible. Okay. I, I know it's hard, <laughs> believe me, but you know, Sleep if you have to, because you're definitely going through, your body's definitely going through some changes right now. Thank you. You're welcome.